Black Oak Sport. I'm your host, Paul Twardak. Today, I'm joined by John Shen. John spent 20 years working for Alaska's Department of Fish and Game as a scientist studying black-tailed deer, mountain goats, and brown bears in the Tongass National Forest. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Paul. It's really great to be here. Yeah, I am just absolutely fascinated with this book. I, uh, I think I, I, I binged read it. Uh, it, to me, was part um, natural history. I learned a lot of natural history about uh, the Tongass. It was a part field manual, how to be a field scientist, uh, a big part of, of being a memoir and a conservationist, and also drama, like high drama, because there was so much was at stake, and there's still at stake in the Tongass with logging and the ecosystem there. So I'm really looking forward to talking to this. Why don't we start a little bit with you, just uh, give us an outline of, of the book. Okay. Uh, I began thinking about writing this book uh, well before uh, I put my finger to the keyboard. Uh, I felt strongly that I needed to document my four decades of experience uh, doing science on the Tongass, doing conservation on the Tongass, exploring the Tongass, and uh, dealing with politics. And uh, uh, the subtitle is uh, uh, Looking at the, the Ecosystem Through the Politics of Trees. And uh, uh, conservation is really important. Um, I had amazing experiences. I was so fortunate. I was able to capture and track black-tailed deer, mountain goats, and brown bears, learn how they use their forest habitat, and I used boats and airplanes instead of pickup trucks. Yeah. And uh, th that was an amazing part of... And, and helicopters, which we'll get to and, also. And, and <laughs> helicopters. Yeah. But, but I piloted the boats and the airplanes, and, uh, and then, of course, rode in the helicopters. Uh, uh, later, after my work with Fish and Game and I retired, I went to work for Audubon, Alaska, and uh, I looked more broadly at the whole ecosystem and tried to assess the complex ecological interactions and design conservation strategies that would really uh, help us preserve the Tongass. Um, the Tongass is the, nas the largest national forest in the nation, and it's I think, arguably, the Earth's most significant expanse of intact temperate rainforest. Um, th this is a cautionary tale that can, that, of the harm that can result when science is eclipsed by the politics focused on short-term economic gain. And I get into those issues. But the book is also filled with many field experiences, some that were exciting, some that were a little bit mundane. But working in this area, it, it's a wild and spectacular coastal rainforest. Yeah, it's also uh, a story of you raising a family, um, a, 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 a bunch of it early on, uh, and being raised sort of off the grid on the water. Um, so let's talk about your childhood and start with that and how that affected your path in life. Uh, well, yeah. I grew up on Orcas Island in the San Juan Islands of Washington State. We had to take a ferry to our house or, or fly. My dad was a commercial pilot to start with. He, he taught me both my brother and I, how to fly. Uh, and that was a very significant part of my life in Alaska where I did a lot of my own flying in my research and in conservation work. Uh, I, we also used boats, and I learned to sail and operate boats, uh, which was great preparation. Uh, I went to college, uh, Whitman College, uh, in eastern Washington, uh, thinking I would be an economics major. My f freshman year, I got a D in economics. <laughs> <laughs> biology was my best topic, so a biology major I became, and I really enjoyed biology. Uh, field trips and uh, s snorkeling and doing marine biology, um, and I, I was kind of wondering when I was a senior what I was going to do with this, and I was sitting in... Uh, the dorm room my senior year with some friends watching uh, the Craighead brothers there with their yeah. National Geographic uh, show on grizzly bears. And after that, I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a wildlife biologist and use boats and airplanes in my work. And ultimately, it led to Alaska. I want to backtrack a little bit to your childhood. Um, somewhere along the way, I, I remember reading the book that you weren't necessarily the best student. You got easily distracted by things outdoors, and um, and not your family not wasn't necessarily conservationist or environmentalist, but somehow along the way, 
you got a PhD. <laughs> so what motivated you? Like how, how that path happened for you? Uh, not how it happened, but maybe why it happened. Well, that's, that's true. Uh, you know, in my book, I talk about in the fifth grade looking out the window at a maple tree, really big maple tree, and I was really easily distracted and kind of forgot what was going on in the classroom. Uh, but I think that uh, we hunted deer in our backyard. We lived on 100 acres, an old farm, and we uh, uh, dug clams and caught salmon and uh, picked up oysters off the beach, and we weren't a member of any conservation organization in my family, but we always were careful just to take what you could use at the time and don't take too much and don't take it from the same places. And so that was kind of the background of my conservation ethic. And then I, I got into college and I, I studied biology and got into graduate school and added some ecological theory to my bio, biology. And, you know, I feel that conservation is about using resources, but using it smartly so that we always sustain the resource for future generations. We have a responsibility to, to do that, but we don't always do that. Yeah. And, and that very much, um, uh, I, I think Aldo Leopold was a big influence on you also, and uh, that, that, meant that sort of reflects his philosophies. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, in college, and then you came to Alaska, and I, I think you met your wife in college, is that correct? That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. We uh, met in, as undergraduates and, and married, and we actually, actually we came to Alaska in 1970 uh, as assistance to a, a wildlife photographer, and we knew we wanted to come back. And uh, after um, my PhD program, University of Washington, we got on the ferry and headed uh, headed to Alaska in the fall of 1976. And I worked for Fish and Game uh, as a temporary employee for about nine months. And then I was offered a research position in Juneau, uh, studying, starting out studying black-tailed deer and mountain goats. And yeah. then it just kept moving on from there. Let's talk about those studies, because um, I think that really uh, explains or uh, illustrates your science background and how important that was in all your work. So let's start. I think the first study was it deer or, or yeah, deer was the first study. Yeah. Y yes, um, th there had been a lot of logging going on in Southeast in in the mid seventies. You know, it started in the fifties, and uh, uh, fish and game uh, supervisors really wanted to get a better handle on what the impact of logging was on deer. So I teamed up with uh, Charlie Walmo, who I mentioned, uh, from the Forest Service Research Branch, and we designed a simple study to go out and look at paired plots of old-growth forest and adjacent clear cuts and second growth. And we wanted to, since you can't watch deer in the forest, we designed a study where we ran transects and counted Deer pellets, deer uh, poop, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, you yeah. know, transects, and we measured their use of, of different aged clear cuts and second growth compared to the adjacent old growth. And the results were just black and white. They were remarkable. Deer used old growth forest much more than they used second growth and, and even clear cuts. More use of clear cuts in the summertime than in the winter. But it was a very simple study. But it really put uh, a lot of people, uh, they were surprised because the conventional wisdom is that clear cutting was like ringing a dinner bell. Clear cutting was good for deer. Well, in northern British Columbia, in British Columbia, in, in southeast Alaska, it's not that way at all. And we learned later that even uh, old growth forest throughout much of the North American continent was very valuable winter deer habitat, but there were really no scientific studies early on. Uh, so that was one of the things we did. And that really created an uproar in the Forest Service, especially the timber management division and the timber industry. I mean, we were persona non grata. Uh, Charlie bet. Wong and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and our, and our uh, 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 collaborator, Matt Kirchhoff, that worked with us on that project. And, and so explain, so yeah, you sort of disprove this idea that you talk in the book about the deer follow the ax. Um, and, uh, but explain a little bit why that is. So what, why is that habitat important for deer, that old big 
Big tree, old growth habitat. Yes. Yeah. The old growth is a steady state forest. Uh, here in southeast Alaska, uh, we have trees of all ages and sizes in old growth, uh, from seedlings and saplings to trees that may be 800, 900 years old. And on really good sites, some of those trees uh, were originally, you know, five, six to 10 feet in, in, in diameter. Uh, uh, but uh, that's where the, the timber harvest really f- focused. Well, when you cut a forest like that and you start with everything the same age from seedlings and they grow up and they, into saplings and pretty soon the, the smooth conifer plantation, all the trees are the same age and size, block out the sunlight. And the forest floor is essentially a desert. Yeah. I mean, there's no green plants that grow on the forest floor after about 25 or 30 years. Now, the clear cuts have a lot of uh, herbaceous and shrubby vegetation for a while, uh, up until about 25 years. But when the snow comes, it covers oh, with yeah. snow and there's no food. So essentially, um, the old growth forest has cover from snow and it has an abundance of deer food. And when you cut it, that all changes. And that's why uh, old growth forest is so important for deer. We learned later as we kept moving along in our studies that old growth forest has very high value for many, many species of wildlife and fish and salmon. Yeah, we'll get into that as we go along. One of the interesting things I thought about the deer study was this idea of, well, if you wait long enough, let's say 100 years, it'll grow back up and you can cut it again. But you sort of said, well, that wasn't really good for the deer either. Yes, right? yes, the key. <laughs> this is really a key issue for any ecologist or forest manager working uh, in the temperate rainforest. Old growth is non-renewable. When it's cut on hunt- short rotations as 80 to 100 years or 120 years, you never get back to the old growth. Yeah. And the, the ecological value of old growth is very high and very valuable fish and wildlife habitat. Yeah. And not only that, but we're learning that old growth forests have very high carbon storing potential. So if we want to fight climate change and mitigate climate change, the best way to do it is to leave these big old trees that are accumulating vast amounts of carbon. Yeah, we'll talk about that later too. So one of the interesting things, uh, you're out there literally walking through the woods um, and uh, just maybe even one other guy, uh, right? <laughs> and um, so that, uh, A, I thought it was super interesting is you learned a lot just by doing that, just by being on the ground and learning and walking in the woods. Yes, that's and right. How, how, explain why that's important. Because nowadays we have remote sensing, we have satellites, we have the ability to study a lot of this stuff without being on the ground. But So why is being on the ground important? Well, I think you can, you can assimilate what is going on seasonally, uh, weather-wise, and weather is so important. And when we were looking at deer use, and later we were using radio transmitters and radio collaring deer and mountain goats and brown bears, and we were able, of course, we were up in an airplane for part of that time, uh, but we were able to see what was going on on the ground, what the snow conditions were like, what the weather was like, and the habitats that were important to to deer or brown bear or mountain goats. It really helped us get a lay of the land. Yeah. Uh, This is uh, Alaska Public Media. You're listening to Outdoor Explorer. I'm your host, Paul Tordock. I'm here with John Shane, talking about his book, uh, The Tongass Odyssey. John, uh, let's... Well, one, let's go back on deer a little bit because you've got some great stories in here. We'll get to one in the bear in a minute, but... uh, you were trying to capture deer because this is again before GPS and satellite, so you were doing telem- telem- uh, telemetry. telemetry, sorry, te- telemetry from airplanes. So you had to capture and put collars on these deer. And I just thought the the stories about you trying to net these animals from. So explain the idea about that. Like, trying to lasso a, 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 an animal more or less from a helicopter or, or whatever. Uh, just that was kind of crazy. Well, uh, most of the deer we captured, we captured by hunting, sneaking through the woods with a capture gun that shot a little dart with a mobilizing drug in it. And, uh, you know, that's hard work. You you really put your time in uh, getting deer that way. So, you know, I got thinking in the summertime, the deer were up in high alpine, up in the open country. And man, you know, maybe we 
we could get a, a net. And uh, so, you know, I tried it out. Jack Lentford was in the helicopter. I was on the float of this Hughes 500 <laughs> yeah. airplane or helicopter with uh, a persane, a piece of persane net that we kind of put together. And we could fly right up on the deer. And, you know, we tried not lassoing them, but dropping the right, net yeah, over yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. And when, one time I remember on Admiralty Island on Robert Barron Mountain, about 3,000 feet high up in the Alpine, and the pilot was flying over, and the deer just went zip off toward a really steep slope, and the helicopter followed it over, and I'm looking down about 3,000 feet oh boy. at the shoreline. And I'm not tied onto the helicopter. I've got my <laughs> legs like on like a horse, and I th was thinking, you know, you're on, the float of, you're on the float of the helicopter. I'm you're on, the float. Of the, float of the, I'm yeah, on yeah. the float of the helicopter. And I, I don't think this is a very good idea. <laughs> and so it, we, we abandoned that idea. But what we did do is that the folks up in uh, Fairbanks were using a net gun to capture caribou. Ah, and uh -huh. that was developed in New Zealand with red deer. So we, I had some of my colleagues from up there come down, and we used a net gun. It, it, this little... little you know, container, it shot uh, three shotgun shells out and it the net came in a plume and would go right, you have to get right behind the animal. Yeah. But that really worked well. And we captured, I don't know, probably a dozen or more deer up in the Alpine with a net gun. Uh, Better uh, than trying to lasso them with a per se net. Yeah. Yeah, the book has some great natural history about deer and goats and bears. We'll get to bears in a minute. Um, and I thought uh, that that's sort of how they migrate, a yearly migration. All It all was like super fascinating read for those people interested in the natural history of these animals. Uh, let's go, you then did goats for a little bit. And that again was to determine if they're using old growth, which- Which they think, were. Uh, a little uh, bit, yeah, which, it, is, it, which surprised me actually. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the winter, uh, in deep, wet snow. Now we're, you know, on the coast. Yeah. Uh, and they'd move down, uh, not necessarily the kind of old growth that they would, uh, that they would harvest, that, that the industry would cut, but uh, uh, steep slopes. And they'd move in under the forest canopy where the snow wasn't as deep. So uh, goats were using uh, old growth, but a very different kind of old growth than the deer were using. Well, in what way? Uh, well, in very steep, Country, oh, country, rocky, right, yeah. rocky slopes up higher. Now in Glacier Bay uh, and Tracy Arm, uh, goats go right down to tidewater. Yeah. And, you know, they're right on the shoreline. You see them literally right next to the shore. And that, that's, you see that in Kachemak Bay and also in Kenai Fjords in yeah. places. Yeah, I've seen them on the water right out of Seward, actually. Yeah, at, right. Down, right on the water. It's, it, it, oh, there's a goat. You think of the mountain goats, but they're in the mountains, and the mountains are right to the ocean. So, um and then we move to bears, which is really a big part of the book, is about the um, brown slash grizzly bears. Uh, so, how did you get involved? And in what what sort of why why did you take that direction? Well, uh, we felt that th there was so little information on the importance of old growth forest to wildlife, and we felt that there was a lot more to learn about deer and and goats. Uh, but we didn't really have much information on brown bears. Uh, so we decided that we would move into brown bears, and the goat or the, the deer work continued. Matt Kirchhoff uh, kept that work going on, but I began the study of uh, bears in 1981. And I kind of did both for a couple of years, but then moved entirely into the, the bear yeah. realm. And basically the same idea. We wanted to l learn about the seasonal distribution and seasonal habitat use of bears and how mining and logging would affect. And roads. Brown bears. Also. And yeah, roads, roads, yeah. Yep. Roads yep, are a big key deal, issue. A big deal. We'll get to that. So you had an exciting moment with the bears. I think you have an expert from, excerpt from the book that you want to share. Sure. Why don't you set the stage here a little yes. bit with this? Yes. Uh, uh, Laverne Beyer uh, worked with me as our wildlife technician. And he and I worked on the brown bear study. And we were, uh, one of the projects we did, uh, we radio collared about 100 bears. And uh, we uh, would look at their 
den site selection and where they denned and the timing of the denning and so on. So this reading uh, relates to a little section I had of an experience we had uh, dealing with a, a bear den. It was early June 1982, and Laverne and I had just landed in a helicopter on a snow-covered alpine ridge at about 2,500 feet on northern Admiralty Island. We had marked this site with a radio collar we dropped out of the tracking aircraft earlier in the winter while we were monitoring the den locations of our radio collared bears. We were standing at the mouth of the bear's winter den as I was preparing to slide down through the snow tunnel, enter the den, and measure and describe its characteristics. Standing there on three feet of snowpack, however, I was seriously contemplating a small complication. (laughs) The bear's radio collar was still transmitting from deep within the den. This female bear had denned with her two-year-old male offspring. We had seen these bears standing outside their den a week earlier, and we were relatively confident she had shed her collar inside the den, that the den was now empty. With a flashlight in one hand and my handgun in the other, I started down the steep, narrow, four-foot-long snow tunnel to the small opening in a rock cavity. As my head went into the jagged rock entrance, I asked Laverne and our pilot, who were holding my feet, to give me a few moments. Uh before I continued down into the dark, dank void. Although I was 99% sure the bears were gone, that 1% weighed heavily on me as I hung suspended with my arms and head just within the den entrance. Not knowing what I would find below, my fear was escalating. After a moment, I told them to let me go, and I wriggled down into the den cavity. Once in the den, I located the slip collar breathed a big sigh of relief, and went to work measuring and recording the den's configuration. The den was clean, no odor. It was a secure but cramped site for a mother bear and her cub to overwinter for six months. That's a, that's crazy. I, I can't imagine going into a den like that, not knowing what the bear, I'm sorry, I'm pretty sure it wasn't there, but 1% <laughs> still 1%. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, it all, all it took is 1%. <laughs> But overall, it sounds like you had a, a a good career with bears. You didn't. You had a couple exciting moments that you relate to. But overall, you never had to shoot one. It sounds like you came close once. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think that there are probably many, many bears that are shot um, uh, unnecessarily. And you know, who's to assess? You know, how someone feels when they're out there in the woods in a bear is confronts them. But I think you can learn bear behavior. You can learn places to avoid, and you can uh, learn to, to, to read their reaction and uh, not push. And you know, don't really want to walk around in heavy brush along a salmon stream when the, there are lots of bears in the stream. Now, we snared some bears, so we were down in those situations. <laughs> but uh, um, we, we had relatively few serious interactions. Which is amazing because you were walking, set in snares, and walking through by salmon streams in probably brushy terrain. So that's very impressive. Um, And uh, as it turns out, um, I don't recall the exact number, but I think about 75% of the bears that we captured were captured uh, from a helicopter uh, and yeah. darting them up yeah. in this alpine or down on the big grass flats. Right. But we did, we started out and uh, uh, we we snared a number of bears, which in itself is not, you know, it's a stressful experience for both the biologist and the bear. Yeah. Because you're working at close quarters. And when you get a bear in a snare, then you want to get up and dart them, usually in the big hind quarter. And then the, the, the drugs, you know, Put the bear to sleep, and it it tranquilizes them, and you can work on them, and then get a radio call to them and get it out of the way. Yeah. So, what were some of the findings with the bear study? What what were you finding? Well, um, bears use old growth forest, you know, throughout the throughout the year, um, but seasonally they use their habitat very selectively. They're large animals, and they hibernate, go dormant for from four to six months of the year. Uh, so they really have to pack on 
the calories and build up their fat reserves to be able to get through the winter. So they're really focused on going to the most uh, high-quality foraging sites. You know, they feed on fish, of course, during the fish season. And early in the spring, they get down and they eat skunk cabbage roots and they eat sedges that are just coming out on the grass flats. Uh, then they move up into the subalpine. There's a lot of use of sub subalpine where they're feeding on roots and succulent uh, herbaceous vegetation. Uh, a lot of breeding activity goes up on up in those areas. Um, but during the fish season, from you know mid July through August and into early September, you know most not all the bears use those areas, but most of the bears do, and they're using a band in the riparian forest, the streamside forest, especially surrounding salmon streams. And of course, some of these places are the same places that roads are built and logging goes on because those are the big, high quality spruce stands, and uh, so. We found that bears generally avoided clear cuts, especially females with cubs. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, so th- our assessment, and there were other folks, Rod Flynn and Kim Titus, uh, who worked with Laverne after I left, uh, who found the same uh, information. These riparian corridors are very important. The Forest Service leaves a small buffer of 500 feet if they can demonstrate that it's important to bears. Um, But really, the optimal situation, if you have a high-value habitat with bears, is to protect that whole watershed from ridgetop to ridgetop, from headwaters to tidewater. And uh, that's one of the recommendations we've made. And it's not just the habitat, it's also the roads. And where you have roads, you increase human-bear interactions, which result in legal hunting increase, uh, defense of life and property, which is legal, uh, and um, uh, poaching. Yep. And you you can control legal hunting, but you can't control those other things. Yep. Yeah, we've seen that in Anchorage. I like one of your statements um, that was along the lines of, um, our fear, human fears of, of bears are is real, um, but it ends up not well for the bears. <laughs> Something yes. like that, yeah. Yes, yeah. That, that's right. And it's it's a matter of public education, really helping people understand how to avoid bear encounters. Uh, carrying pepper spray is really a valuable tool. In some cases, probably more valuable than carrying a firearm. Yep. We did carry firearms. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want to maintain bear populations, uh, you really need to minimize roads and minimize yep bear interactions with lots of people. Yep. That's a great way to end our first half. Uh, this is Outdoor Explorer. I'm your host, Paul Tordock. I'm in the studio with John Shane talking about his book and uh, the Atangas Odyssey. We'll be right back with more with John. You're listening to Outdoor Explorer on Alaska Public Media. Find the show anytime as a free podcast in the iTunes store or connect with us online at alaskapublic.org. Welcome back to Outdoor Explorer. I'm your host, Paul Tordock. We're here with John Shin talking about his book, The Last, the Tonga's Odyssey. Now, John, uh, we were talking about the studies, but at the same time, you're raising a family and you have this life. And in your book, you talk about that whole, the whole picture of your work, your family, your, the, uh, and, and sort of what kept you going. Um, so what was going on with the family? Talk, talk to us about the family a little bit. Yeah. Well, we moved to Alaska. And uh, the first year uh, that we were in Juneau, uh, we rented a a duplex in Lemon Creek, just north of downtown Juneau. And, uh, you know, we didn't come to Alaska. I mean, that wasn't exactly what we wanted. So we (laughs) we really wanted to find some waterfront property, but that was very expensive. So we looked around and looked around. And finally, I discovered a couple of lots out on the tip of the Mendenhall Peninsula beyond the road system. And I found one lot 
uh, acre and a half with a stream running through it, and the people that owned it were on Lopez Island in the San Juans, uh-huh. where I'm from. Oh, and nice. I started bugging them. I started writing letters to them, and finally they said, okay, we relent. We'll sell it to you. So we bought that lot, and then we, we bought a Cedar Home kit uh, and barged it up out of Seattle and uh, then had to barge it from Juneau, uh, you know, a few miles to our lot. And we had... Uh, uh, a bunch of friends and some chicken and some beer, and we pulled all of the, the Lincoln logs up on the beach, and uh, that was quite a, a fun project. But Mary and Beth and I built the cabin uh, with help from some friends, and um, uh, we didn't have running water, but we built a little uh, dam in the creek, and we had a pipeline to our house, and we had an oil he- stove, heater, yeah. Uh, and a fireplace, uh, and uh, no electricity, no telephone. So we lived off the grid. We had a million dollar view. We looked to the to the west uh, at the Chilkat Mountains, and we looked to the south at Robert Barron Mountain on Admiralty Island. Uh, nice, a wonderful place. Well, we you know eventually after the house and the dog, we had our first child, Eric, and then uh, a couple of years later, Sarah came along. And we had two skiffs. I went to work, and we had an out hall at our house and an out hall at the end of Fritz Cove Road, which was about half a mile, quarter of a mile down the beach. And uh, uh, I'd go to work, and Mary Beth would take the kids, you know, in the skiff and get them onto the school bus. And it was – we eventually got power and telephone, but it was uh, – it was – extra work and I can't imagine you know I'm 75 now and I just can't imagine that we had that much energy uh, but it was you know we had eagles uh, an eagle nest just down the uh, the shore from us and we had river otters and herons and and kingfishers and it was just an amazing place to live and uh, eventually uh, you know after a couple of years we were using the little skiffs and uh, I was using fish and game boats but I decided that you know We've got to get a boat. And yeah. so we found a boat down on Orcas Island, a friend of my dad's, and a 38-foot wood troller hull uh, with a Chrysler Crown engine. And Jack Landfer, who is now retired, he and I went into partnership, and we bought the boat. And we ran it up the coast uh, to Juneau. And having that boat was really cool because I could take my family out with me. Yeah, you know, on the field work. In, yeah. in some of the field work. And so many folks, you know, you're in the field for a long time and, you you know, it's really challenging. But this way the family was engaged and uh, it was really fun. The kids enjoyed it and they got to see bears and snares and they got to get involved. And, you know, it, maybe it's no coincidence. Our, our son Eric is... Uh, a research professor at UAF uh, studying salmon in the Yukon River and climate change. And our daughter, Sarah, uh, is a seabird biologist here with Alaska Science Center and and Anchorage, looking yeah. at climate change. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, it was fun. It was hard work, but that was kind of bringing the family into some of the experiences that I had. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a, what a way, and it sort of sort of um, reflects your childhood too. It and does, in, yeah, in a way, yeah. yeah. That ex, and that experience of education. Part, one part of the book you quote someone, maybe it was Leopold, about how experiential education, you know, is so important in becoming a scientist and a professional. Yes, yes, I think that uh, you know when I was growing up, uh, you know, we we learned the birds, we learned where the clams were, you know, we knew where the deer were and it just being outdoors you know we'd take family vacations on a boat and uh, uh, you know seeing a brown or black bear this is Vancouver Island no brown bears seeing a black bear on the shoreline was just really fun yeah. I mean so it was very similar you know when experience first the first trip I took to Admiralty Island with Charlie Walmo flying in a beaver down to Hood Bay uh we landed on the beach and we'd seen humpback whales and we saw huge brown bear tracks and the mud on the beach and listening to the blue grouse. And I just thought to myself, John, this is work and you're getting paid to do yeah, this? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's uh, super true, like that kind of stuff, because our next section, we're going to talk about some of that work, maybe the stuff that's not, was so important, uh, and that's the conservation work. So you've um, done these studies with the, the deer and the brown bears and the mountain goats, and you've made a name for yourself as a scientist. Um, and 
you're standing up speaking truth to power, as you say in the book. Um, and there's some powerful interests that uh, don't like what you're saying about the importance of these old growth forests in the Tongass. Um, so let's talk a bit about that. Let's go through some numbers a little bit for us. Like what is the, you know, how, how much old growth is in the Tongass, what's left, um, and, and what's happened to the Tongass over the last couple hundred years? Okay. Well, the uh, Tongass National Forest is the largest national forest in the United States, 16.7 uh, million acres. Um, and interestingly, it's, it's one of the most important intact old growth temperate rainforests left on Earth. But when you look at th the makeup of the landscape, non-forest areas represent 40% of the Tongass. Mm -hmm. But glaciers. And, glaciers yeah. and yeah. rock and alpine and muskeg bogs. So what they call productive old growth, this is potentially commercial forest land, represents only 30% of the Tongass land base. So we're just putting this into perspective. And uh, what is most attractive to the timber industry is the large tree old growth. And that only represents... 3% of the Tongass land base. And wow. essentially, that's where the timber harvest has really focused. Early on, uh, the industry, which started in the 50s, you know, would log entire watersheds, uh, especially on Prince of Wales Island. And then later into the mid-70s and 80s, they were logging smaller, you know, 50 to 100-acre clear-cut patches. But in every case, the industry always selected or high-graded cherry-picking the best, you know, take the cream of the crop. And from an economic standpoint, that made sense. But those sites are, have always been rare on the Tongass, and those sites have very high value for salmon, for a whole suite of wildlife. And, you know, as we learn more about individual species and how they use the forest differently, we realize that the old growth ecosystem was uh, very complex and was what it wasn't just about deer, it was about the entire ecosystem. Uh, so to point out that the industry was very selective in their harvest, uh, not selective in tr single trees, but selective in taking the biggest uh, blocks of old growth they could. One example, uh, and this was a, a study that uh, Dave Albert and I published in Conservation Biology in 2013, um, on North Prince of Wales Island, which had the best timber in all of Alaska, the industry harvested 94% of the contiguous, this is the big blocks, of uh, high-volume old-growth forest. So, and, of course, that also resulted in a whole uh, network of logging roads. That has had a tremendous impact on, uh, you know, from flying squirrels to black-tailed deer to black bear. Uh, and I actually participated in a deer summit on Prince of Wales Island this fall, hmm. uh, and I per, uh, participated uh, on Zoom. I didn't travel down there, but uh, the, the biologist and the deer hunters and the people that live there realized that all of that logging has had a tremendous impact on black-tailed deer. Deer habitat has diminished, deer populations have diminished, and hunting opportunities have declined as a result of this lockdown. Just, uh, as Proof positive. Uh, right, as your studies sort of showed back That's right. in the 70s and 80s. And That's right. I, I also liked, I, I was really eye-opener to me hearing about the difference between old growth and large tree old growth. And that's, I think what you mean, high value, high volume, is that that's what you're yes. talking about, they're really big trees. So explain to us what you mean by big tree. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, of the, again, you know, 40% of the Tongass doesn't have trees at all. And then 30% of the Tongass has what's classified as commercial old growth. And, um, but all old growth isn't the same. If you've walked into a muskeg bog where the, the soil is wet and boggy, along the periphery of that bog is old growth forest. And you can see a mountain hemlock tree uh, or a shore pine a mountain hemlock I'll take as an example, or, or uh, uh, Alaska yellow cedar, and the tree might be 
you know, 18 inches, 20 inches in diameter. And some of those trees will be four or five or 600 years old. It's old growth, but yep, it's small, small tree old growth. It's scrub old growth. And the large tree old growth, it's a classification actually where the average diameter of the tree is 21 inches, uh, which, huh. which it's, isn't- It's pretty small. Yeah. But, but <laughs> yeah. in those stands of the, uh, of the, the large tree old growth, you have individual trees that are three and four feet in diameter. Um, I've actually uh, took a group of scientists in Tenneke Inlet on Chichikoff Island, and we're looking for an example of a, a, a large tree old growth. And we got in, and we, we measured at, at Sitka spruce that was over nine feet in diameter wow. and over 200 feet tall. Wow. An amazing tree. Yeah. Those kinds of trees are very, very rare today. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have a picture in your book, I think, from Washington of an old uh, red cedar. I think oh, yes, and that was like, that was over 20 feet in diameter. 20 feet, that blew me away. And those, that, that ecosystem's gone. There are a few trees like that left in Olympic National Park yeah. on the Olympic Peninsula. But today, old growth forest, the, the m most abundant old growth forest left is in southeast Alaska Yeah, in the United States. I also like the concept that you, when you talked about this fragmentation of habitat, sort of diversity, and not just diversity in the uh, number of different species, but also in within a species. You want to talk about that and how the effects of luck have, have changed that? Yes. Um, the, the old growth forest is very complex in a, in, a, in a small scale. I mean, you can walk you know, on the edge of a muskeg and over toward the riparian forest and, you know, uh, 30 meters yards away, you can be in trees that are three and four feet in diameter. And then you come over and you get into the, the trees that are very small. And those habitats have different kinds of species assemblages. And uh, so deer, bears, they use the habitat on a fine scale, you know, following deer around in the wintertime when the snow's deep, you know, deer avoid getting into deep snow because you know that post holing through snow ain't any fun. <laughs> it really takes a lot of energy. So the deer are trying to focus their movements and they're conserving their energy and they'll move around the base of a large old growth tree and they'll eat the bunchberry and the trailing raspberry. Uh, and then they'll move to another tree. And in between the trees, the snow may be very deep, but they're using their habitat in a very selective way. And we found with deer, for example, in winters of deep snow, the deer spent over 60% of their time in high volume old growth, the big tree, the large tree yeah. old growth. Same, two different terminologies for the same yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. And in, in um, uh, those kinds of winters, they spent you know less than ten percent of their time in the low volume, uh huh, yeah, right, forest. Yeah. And then in a in a really mild forest, they still use high volume, but not nearly as much. Yeah, you know they spread their use out so seasonally, tremendous variety, and from species to species, from flying squirrel to marten to river otter, uh, black-tailed deer, you know, goshawks, uh, marbled murrelets. They're using old growth forest that's very important, but they're using different kinds of old growth forest. Yeah. This is Outdoor Explorer on Alaska Public Media. I'm your host, Paul Tordak. I'm here with John Chen talking about his book, um, The Tongass Odyssey. John, uh, let's talk about the conservation work. Um, it's been really important, and it's been a long and continuing um, challenge to uh, change logging practices and to um, basically um, use your research to influence policy. Um, and so I think, I don't know where to start with this, uh, the, the, the forests have plans um, that they're mandated to do. I think the first plan was when? In the oh, it was maybe 1979 70s. was yeah, the 70s. first Tongass Land Management right. Plan. And then uh, I think, I believe, um, Alaska Native Settlement, or Claims Act, or Alaska Lands Act mandated um, a certain amount of board feet and a, a money to be spent, right? Yes, 450 million board feet a year is yeah. targeted, and I think 40 million dollars to get the cutout. Yeah, so a year, yeah, a year, <laughs> right? Tremendous. And I, I, I recall in the book it said in maybe 1990 it might have peaked at a billion board feet. Does that sound you, about right? When, yeah. when you added in the Tongass Forest 
and state and native corporations. Native corps, right. That's right. Because uh, Enska then, native corporations got land, and they also picked high value, um, high value uh, logging or timber. Um, and so then how did that, because we've, we've then ended up with, with people probably heard about the roadless rule. And so sort of talk us through, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left about that part of your career. Like, and, and, and eventually left up fishing game and started working for Audubon. Um, so talk to us a little bit about where, how that process has gone about and um, how your science has helped influence that. Well, I retired from fishing game in uh, end of 1996, uh, went to work for Audubon, Alaska in January of 97. And uh, at Audubon, I wasn't doing field research, although we did, my colleagues at the Conservancy and elsewhere, we did publish some books on uh, not field work so much as uh, looking at uh, GIS, uh, geographic yep. information, uh, uh, computer plans, and uh, uh, at Audubon, uh, I continued to work on the Tonkas. I also worked in Arctic issues and with beluga whales and so on, but Tongass was always a major focus of my work uh, at Audubon. And uh, uh, it was, uh, at that point, we were really looking at the, f the forest as an ecosystem that had very high value. And uh, we were still getting pushback. I'm going to step back just a moment, though, and say that uh, I testified f twice uh, yeah, before right. Congress. Yeah. Uh, That's uh, the drama. I, I that testified was drama. before yeah. Congress to the House of uh, Representatives and the Senate uh, when I was at Fish and Game. And that was contentious because I was told that, well, uh, the state of Alaska told uh, uh, the House uh, uh, John Cyberling, who was chairing the Natural Resources Committee, that I was unavailable. And then they, they said they didn't have enough money to send me. And I, I said, well, I'll pay my own way. And I, I was going to get a, some grant uh, money to, to buy my ticket back there. Uh, it, it, was, it, it was really stressful uh, going back. And you know, basically, I put together a slideshow. And I showed the House Resources Committee uh, slides of uh, the Tongass forests, the things we've been talking about, how old growth forest is important to deer and to other species. And uh, it was really interesting. The chief of the Forest Service at the time, uh, Max Peterson, uh, testified and said that, well, everybody knows that uh, clear cuts are good for deer. Huh. And there was a little ripple of laughter that came from <laughs> the audience that was there, and because I had just said that the opposite, yeah. and I and I had evidence, I had the slide program, and uh, uh, Congressman Cyberling commented on that, and I included in my book some excerpts from the congressional record on those issues. But that was really challenging, and uh, Matt Kirchhoff and myself and others, uh, Charles. Uh, 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 Jack Lentford testified at those hearings. Um, he was retired at the time. Uh, I think that scientists have a responsibility to share their science with the general public and with decision makers. And there can be tremendous pressure on scientists to keep their mouths shut or to say something yeah. else. Yeah. Look, at, look at the tobacco industry uh, as a good example. Uh, look at the the pesticide in industry with Rachel Carson and so on. So those things have been with us for a long time. I was very fortunate at Fish and Game that I had support from my supervisors. Yeah, that's. I was really impressed with that that they were supporting you. So uh, that, anyway, though those backing yeah. up, there was a lot of pressure, and I, I feel strongly that scientists have a responsibility. When I moved to Audubon. I didn't work for a government agency. I worked for a conservation organization. So I had less pressure that way. But, but I really had to push hard uh, at the time to make sure that we represented science fairly because as a scientist, all I have is my integrity. Yep. And if I lose my integrity, I've lost everything. Yep. So you really have to walk a fine line. And each scientist has to understand what the, how they're going to address that. And uh, uh, you have to be true to your data. 
And I think that over the last 10 years, more and more conservation organizations have hired scientists. So science now plays an important role in, in conservation. Yep. So I think that's so important. Um, and we've had, obviously, politically, uh, things are becoming more and more charged. And with the internet, people can put out there and say anything they want to. And it's been very, very challenging to, for scientists. Um, and you know, climate change being the, the big, um, big one on everybody's radar. Uh, let's. So where are we with Tongass now? I mean, what we, we've, we've been... <laughs> Gone through some um, a lot of different management plans. Um, the roadless rule was in effect, and it wasn't in effect, and now it's um, maybe coming back into effect. Um, so, so, yeah. So let me uh, yeah, just yeah. address the roadless rule, yeah. which was really important. And I was at Audubon when that rule was passed under the Clinton administration. Uh, Mike Dombeck was chief of Forest Service. He really pushed that. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, what that did was nationally, there's a national roadless rule, and roadless areas in the national forest would be set aside for no roads and no development because they're so rare. There are 9 million acres of roadless on the Tongass. Mm, yeah, a lot. I mean, it's yeah, a, a lot, significant yeah. thing. Um, but... Uh, the thing you have to keep in mind is that much of the rock and ice along the mainland coast is roadless. So, uh, you know, I, I think the roadless rule was very important for the Tongass. The, the Alaska congressional delegation fought that tooth and nail all the way, but it was passed, and then Bush came in and overruled it, and then, uh, you know, it got pushed back again, and it's been going back and forth, and Trump uh, avoided the roadless rule. So we no longer had the roadless rule in Alaska. And then uh, when Biden came in, uh, uh, we now have, he recently uh, uh, decided that there would be, that we would apply the roadless rule again to Alaska. So all of those areas would be uh, set aside for no roads and no logging. Well, he went a little bit further, and I think this is even more significant ecologically th than the roadless rule, which I support. Uh, uh, he said, his administration said that we will no longer do commercial logging of old growth. Yeah. That's, that's huge. That's big. Yeah. That's huge. And in my opinion, having spent 45 years of my professional life involved in these issues, Old growth forest is so rare in the world that it makes no sense to continue clear cutting. I mean, you can harvest individual trees, but it makes no more sense to, to clear cut old growth forest because it, it's non renewable. It's gone forever. So uh, I think that that this is very very significant. Um, and just, I think, kind of pulling my thoughts together, when yeah. I first started work on the Tongass in 1977, I was focused on individual species. 45 years later, I realized it's all about the ecosystem. It's yep. not about individual species. 75 years ago, Aldo Leopold, who you mentioned earlier, who is really the pioneer of wildlife science in, in North America, stated that the first principle of conservation is to save all the parts. Boy, I'm an advocate of that. Yep. That is really what it's about. And I think the Tongass is one of the few places left on Earth where we still have the opportunity to conserve all the parts of the ecosystem, uh, including ancient trees, productive salmon, brown bears, wolves, forest birds. You know, this is what we have on the Tongass that really doesn't, you know, Northern British Columbia, uh, they don't have the same. Uh, diversity that we have in terms of the big trees left anymore. But, uh, you know, this North Pacific temperate rainforest yep. is really important. That's so um, so true, I think. Um, but, you know, I would also say in your book, you don't necessarily um, say no locking. You're, and I talk about that secondary growth, and there is potential um, for jobs and for healthy communities out there also, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there are about 500 acres of 
second growth or five hundred thousand, I think five five hundred thousand acres, yeah. right, right, of uh, of second growth in in younger clear cuts, and uh, there is a segment of second growth forest that's you know ready to be harvested again. Uh, it doesn't have the same value as old growth from a timber quality standpoint, um, and it does face problems of transportation. We have to get that yep. to I'll market. And, you know, we're competing against the Southeast United States and the Pacific Northwest. But regardless, uh, there is forest that can be logged, but we shouldn't be logging old growth. Yeah. We can be logging the mature second growth, which is basically a plantation, already has roads to it. Uh, the economics of doing that is another question. Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, uh, Easier to cut one one big tree down than lots of smaller trees, but well, I suppose, well yeah. the the quality of timber quality uh, yeah, yeah yeah you know these so the 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 battle continues on all all sides and it seems like we talked about the changes of administration and that'll that'll continue, but I think you have another excerpt to read from the book that we can wrap up with that really I think um, summarizes maybe why this is important to you sure. Much of the North American continent has changed substantially over the last four centuries, with a consequent diminishment of wilderness lands and waters. Few people today have had the opportunity to walk through dense jungles of dripping devil's club, salmonberry and stink current shrubs beneath towering spruce trees four to eight feet in diameter, to follow massive bare footprints embedded in deep moss and saturated earth, to inhale the stench of spawned out salmon, to listen to a cacophony of eagles, gulls, and ravens, all the while anxiously looking over their shoulders for the great bear that indisputably owns this ancient forest. Such a walk among centuries-old trees is truly an extraordinary and primeval experience possible in few places in the world outside the coastal rainforest of southeast Alaska and portions of northern British Columbia's coast. Wild rivers, teeming fish, gigantic trees, eagles, deer, wolves, bears, and a variety of forest birds are all interconnected parts that make up the heart and soul of Alaska's Tongass National Forest. But unfortunately, some of the fundamental parts of this incomparable forest ecosystem are now unraveling from death by a thousand cuts. That's very powerful. John, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, this has been Outdoor Explorer. I'm your host, Paul Torrey. We've had John Shane on the show talking about his book, The Tongass Odyssey. We'll have links to the book and other resources on our website. Thanks, John, for joining us today. Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. Want to learn more about Temperate Rainforest? The 5th Annual Prince William Sound Natural History Symposium is on Tuesday, May 16th in Whittier or online. This free day-long event brings together the latest in news and research about Prince William Sound. A link to register will be on the Outdoor Explorer website. Thanks to my guest, John Shane, whose book is titled Tonga's Odyssey. As always, a bit dance to our producer, Eric Borg. This is your host, Paul Tordock, and from all the hosts at Outdoor Explorer, thanks for listening. Take a walk in the woods, and we'll see you outdoors. Outdoor Explorer is a production of KSKA Public Radio in Anchorage, Alaska. Theme music is by Portugal, The Man. Views expressed are those of the participants and do not reflect the station or its underwriters. You can find Outdoor Explorer on Facebook and in your favorite podcast app. To see what's coming up on Outdoor Explorer and add your voice to the conversation, go to our website at alaskapublic.org. Life Informed. This is Alaska Public Media.